Hi, my name is Lisa Watson and I'm here today with uh, another installation of a video from Cycale Enterprises. What I wanted to talk about today is Cycale has this really, really cute line of dog fabric and two of my favorite things are fabric and dogs or cats, so I wanted to come and tell you all about it. I'm going to hold these up for you first and I'll show them to you. Uh, there's actually a uh, quilt uh, free quilt project pattern that we did for Cykel and it features this particular panel and I just want to hold it up and I, I take a look at one of these panels because the animals are so cute. They were drawn by an artist, a famous artist named Dean Russo and he has a real heart for animals and he really likes to take a look at their faces and their eyes. You can tell when someone is a good animal artist when they really capture not just the shape uh, of an animal, but really what's what's going on behind their eyes and capture the expressions on their faces. And you can see just how cute some of these guys are. There's an old basset hound and there's a poodle, a little chihuahua. Um, there's a husky, some various different ones. There's a guy with his tongue hanging out. I had the privilege of actually uh, taking one of these and putting some quilting stitches on it uh, for the example for Cykel's Quilt Market um, booth that they were going to hang up and I just had a lot of fun. I I'm not really a free motion quilter expert at all and I just put some thread, some cute thread into the machine and just kind of doodled. I had fun just kind of messing with it. It's easy. Uh, the animal shapes are fairly forgiving and I just had a lot of fun with it. So check that out. Give it give it a, um, a look over. You can find it uh, probably hopefully at your local quilt shop. If not, contact them and maybe they can get in touch with Cykel and get some from them. So this is the panel. I know you all want to see it. Let's put that off to the side for just a second. And equally as cute is something that's kind of just a little squares or patchwork. It kind of reminds me of the Brady Bunch, but, but even cuter and with um, just animals instead of people. Uh, same guys, some of the same guys, cute faces. He's really captured their expressions. And uh, you could find your favorite person or favorite animal in there and highlight it in the quilt if you wanted to. And I'll show you the quilt project sheet in just a second. Also... There's another one that's just really uh, sort of just has that the dogs all over. So um, R Dean has taken just the dog shapes and then he's put fun sort of a gra graffiti uh, into each of the shapes, which just gives it sort of a, a fun, cute, um, happy sort of a rock and roll feel um, to that. So there's that one. And then lastly, uh, they also did, Cykel did a line of cat fabric, very similar. Dean also drew it. And from there originally came this print, which is kind of just a fun, happy sort of a confetti esque print and we, we're going to use that here in just a minute. What I want to do during the video is to show y'all how to do three basic components of this quilt. So I'll hold up the... I uh, wrote up a quilt project instructions. There's a lady at Cycal that designs the quilts and then they turn them over to me and I've done a lot of different sets of instructions for them. Look on Cycal's website. You find sort of like free projects or the extras or the how-tos area and you kind of go through there um, and they have attachments where you can look through. It'll show you the various SKUs in the line, some sort of like lifestyle pictures of it and then usually the last couple, three, pa three four pages depending on the size of the instructions uh, of each of those will be the quilt page instructions. So this particular one is three. There's a page that shows you the quilt itself, that shows you all the great fabrics and outlines how much to cut, what pieces, what sizes, and what shapes. And then it also, there's the, the first page of actual instructions with, uh, I try to do a lot of different diagrams because the picture's worth a thousand words. And then also have a third page on this one where you can print out all of the templates that you'll need. Now, when you go to print this one out, make sure that you're printing it uh, when you get to your print box and your print dialog. Make sure that you're not letting it do like fit to page or scale to page or anything. You definitely want to print it at 100% because your, uh, your goal is to, there's a little square on here, and when you print it out, take a, a ruler, measure that. The square should measure one inch across and one inch tall, okay? So that's your way to make sure that your templates are going to turn out just right. So I'm going to put this down here where everybody can see it. The, the blocks that we're going to talk about today are, um, there's this strip, okay? There's four of those with some prairie points, which that's kind of an old school thing, but I think they're really, really cute. They can add a lot of sort of uh, three dimension to your quilts. And so I'll show you how to do those because not everybody knows how. They look hard, but they're not, and they're actually kind of fun. Uh, and then I'm going to also show you how to do this block here that's in the corner. There's a strip of them, strip of them across the bottom, and then a few with one really special one in the middle. Uh, and we're going to talk about how to do the special one uh, as well because it has some applique that goes with it. So that's those three. Uh, let's start with the prairie points. 
So here's the deal. Um, as you do the prairie points, and I'll show you how to do a prairie point in a minute, but as you do the prairie points, as you put a slew of them across a strip, and I tell you what size strip to cut and what size squares to cut for the prairie points, what happens is, as you go ahead and sew those to the strip itself, the, the strip can sort of buckle and twist and actually grow a tad bit longer. It almost gets stretched out of shape. So what I recommend is that you take your strip, okay, and sew what I call stay stitching. That's a garment term. Maybe quilters are not as familiar with it. But you just take it and run less than a quarter of an inch because you don't want it to show on top of the, the top of the quilt later. Inside a quarter of an inch, just a line of stitching. And I've done it actually in white. I'll hold it down here in the close-up so you can see it. I did it in white thread so y'all could see it. Normally you'd maybe do it in black thread. But just basically, before you add any prairie points, just take your strip and sew one edge just uh, just inside of a quarter of an inch from there. And that basically that stitching sort of holds the strip intact and will keep it from doing this, this spreading deal as you start to add your prairie points. So here's what a strip looks like once it's got, each one has 22. So here's the deal, um, it doesn't have to have 22. If you make 20 fit or 21 fit, nobody's gonna count them. You make it look good for how it works for you. Ideally though, if you want to, if you wanna try and fit all 22, kind of overlap them anywhere from 3 eighths of an inch to maybe a half an inch, and we'll, we'll take a look at that in just a second. So there's your completed one, and let's see how we do this. You start off, in order to make a prairie point, you begin with a square, all right, and it's very simple. All you have to do is basically just fold it in half. So I'll show that down here on the close-up. You want to fold it in half with the wrong side to the inside. I'd like to give mine just a little spritz of water if you don't have... Um, uh, steam in your iron. I prefer not to put steam in my iron because I think that makes the irons fall apart and rust, especially this little guy. Um, so just basically give it a little spritz and you want to fold it in half. So I just took my square, folded it in half, and so I ended up with a triangle that's half of the square. Then all you need to do is take and fold that in half one more time. So it's kind of like a double-double on the triangle. Now. Uh, be real careful because there's not much fabric here and then your fingers start to get in the way. You don't want to iron over your fingers. But give that another little bit of a spritz. This is where a tiny iron can come in handy. I actually found mine at Walmart. And keeping your fingers out of the way because you do not want to steam burn, you just go ahead and press. And then you've got it pressed. And you've got your little prairie point. All right? And you can do any size of prairie point. Um, this is specified for this quilt, but you could put them in any quilt, truly, once you know how to do it, once you know the beauty of it. So what that does is, then you've got it kind of folded double-double. You want to put the raw edge, so it still has some raw edges, and you'll want to put that along the upper edge of your strip where you did your stay stitching on the right hand or on the right side of the fabric. Of course, these are batiks, so it's not as critical. You don't have to figure out which is which. Um, I've actually already done quite a few. I've, I've, I've pinned them on. And so all you'll do is take and lay it with the raw edges against the raw edge of the strip, overlapping again, maybe between 3 eighths of an inch and a half an inch, and then take a pin and pin it into place. I kind of pinned mine across. And I did that with all of mine. I tried to get them pinned across kind of where I thought maybe they should be, and then if I needed to shift them back or forth, all I'm adjusting is just the one pin. Then, when I finally got to where I knew that all 22 were going to fit correctly. Then I went back and to make it easier to sew, I went back and added a second pin where each of the prairie points overlaps the other. All right, so there's that. So that's a prairie point added. Here's the other thing that you want to look for, and it's not the end of the world, but if you kind of want consistency and a consistent look, I, I told you about your raw edges, but not only will you want to watch where your raw edges end up, um, when you do your little prairie point, okay, he, let's do this one, and I'll show you this one. So this prairie point has, one, once it's completely ironed and folded, it ends up with one raw edge. It ends up with one edge that's just folded. It's a complete fold. And then the other one is kind of like two folds, and it actually is open a little bit. So just for consistency's sake, I went ahead and placed those all so that all of my regular folded edges were off to this one side, and then I did it so that all of my little, where you could still flip it open kind of, um, those open folded, if you want to phrase it that way, those edges were off to this side. It's totally up to you however you want to manage it. Maybe you don't even care. Um, but if, if you don't, if you do, if you want some consistency on it, go ahead and just place them that way in a consistent way. Once you've got them all pinned the way you want to and you've got your 22 arranged across there, 
you can then take and run kind of like you did your stay stitching you'll run another line just to hold and again less than a quarter of an inch okay and because you want to hold these prairie points in place so that when you start placing your other components of the quilt together uh, then those prairie points won't shift around and won't twist and then you open up your quilt and you've got a shock on your hands so hopefully that'll help you to know about prairie points um, let's take a look at one of the other blocks uh, for just a second Let's look at this one here. I'll bring over the instructions one more time. And right here, there's a row of blocks that looks a little bit complicated, but I lined it out for you in the instructions, and I'm going to walk you through the various components of it as well. So there are, there are five, six, seven, eight, nine. So there's like nine of these, and I tell you how to cut out all the pieces that you'll need in order to do it. So how do you begin? You start off with a square. When you're cutting out these squares of this dog, this is from the dog all over. All right? So like that, what you probably want to do, you may want to find your favorite uh, pupper and, and highlight like the dude with the tongue, right? Or I like huskies, you can tell by my shirt, so I might find the husky. I think that's what I ended up with this one. Yeah, I did. I ended up with the husky. Kind of fuss. That's what they call fussy cutting when you, you look at it and you decide how you want the print of the fabric arranged on your square. So I actually took an instant. Normally you might cut this in like strips, you know, just so you could get lots of them and whatnot when you go to cut it out of your fabric. But I, I figured out how I could cut it just on the diagonal so that I could get the dog's face in the right way. So that's your choice. You can figure that out however you want to. Um, what you'll do next then is go to your templates page, that third page of the instructions and you'll take your it's the U template and the V template and you need a certain number of these, a certain number of the short one I line all that out for you in the instructions and what you will do next is you'll take this square that you have cut you'll take the black boutique pieces from the longer template that you cut and you will then arrange them all around let's put the square as you're used to seeing it there we captured another dog, a couple of dogs and all I basically did is you take your black longer template pieces and you place them face down, right sides together, on each of the edges of the square. All right. What's handy about this template is each of the corners of it, normally on many templates it'll run out to a point and then you're not sure exactly where to put uh, the, the edges and, and where the points run off or how to do that. Um, these actual templates are nice because we've sort of round, uh, not rounded, but we've made, cut the corners off in a direction to where when you're trying to line it up with the things that it matches up with, they match up much better than if we'd run them out as points. So you put this on each of the edges, which I've done, there's one, two, three, there's your fourth. Then so you sew it with your uh, quarter inch or your scant quarter inch, as is your preference. And then when you press it and flip that out, there's how far you get that far in your block. All right. So that's the next step of that one. And let's do our further step. Okay. So now, you are going to take it, and you're going to take all of the templates, the little black batik pieces, out of the smaller of the two templates. And you can see, here's our block. We've got our cute little guy with the tongue here on this one, all right? So I cut out several in a fussy cut way. And you can see, here's where I put all of my strips. So we started with him, the center block, all right? And then after we did the center block, then we ran around and we did one, two, three, four of the longer black batik. Now we're putting off this piece at the end. So in order to do that, you take the ones that you've cut from your template, you place it kind of like you did before, um, right sides together, all right, and matching up all your nice notched corners. You sew with your quarter of an inch or scant quarter, and then you flip it, you press it, always press as you go along because you're going to end up with a much nicer outcome. You flip it out, and then there's your block so far. Okay, you've got one, you only do two of these. On the longer of the black boutique template pieces, you did four, because it was one for each side of the square. Here, don't get yourself confused. We're gonna do some other things around the rest of the block, and so just put two, one on either end of this block so far. All right, so that's that. Let's go ahead and add the next couple steps to this block. So, in order to finish this one out, so here we are, Mr. Husky is back again, back in the building, all right? So we have our center, which was cut on point, then we've added each of the four longer strips, and then here we added our two little short template pieces. Next we are going to add our corners. And how do you do that? So what you were left with at our last step was this here. All right, and let's put the little template guy with it so you can see the visual. Okay, so you're, you're there, all right, so far. Then you'll want to take your triangles and you start placing a triangle here, here, 
here and here, and once you have done that, what you're aiming toward is a rectangle. That's what you're trying to get to. Okay. So we have done that. If you picture it, let's tuck this under for now. All right, so, so there's where you would end up with your rectangle. I've already placed this one, this one, and this one on the corners. So I would go ahead and finish up my rectangle by placing that one on. Again, quarter of an inch seam, flip it back and press it. Then what we need to do is our last step for this block to complete these little cute blocks with our little um, catty corner dogs is then you'll take your uh, longer strips, straight batik strips, no template for this one. I tell you how much, what size to cut it. And you put that one on the bottom and then one on the top. And then there's your block, which again, looks very difficult, but you saw it was just a series of steps and I've got the dry diagrams to walk you through it. So let's talk about our third block, which is kind of uh, one of the more fun ones. It, if, if applique is not your thing, then that's fine. Um, but let me give you some tips that can maybe make it a little bit easier and more fun. So to begin with, you kind of want um, a base block that is essentially a, a base component almost, very similar and exactly in the same size as the ones we've just done. So you'll begin with a rectangle where I've told you to cut it. It's just a black rectangle, all right? So here we go. Most you can see this. This originally was just a black batik rectangle, which I've told you how to cut. And what you do is you start out by you'll take a square, you'll take a ruler, and you'll get yourself a pencil. In this case, a pencil works very well because the, if you're using these exact fabrics, the pencil shows up nicely. It doesn't even have to be a dark pencil mark. You will just put your ruler across two corners so that it exactly splits the corner and you have to kind of like you'll get one just right and you'll go check you know do the next and then you'll actually come back and make sure that your first corner that you did is just right that's an Alex Anderson tri uh, tri trip or, I'm sorry Alex Anderson uh, tip or trick that she uses I've seen her when she's wanting to cut uh, a square on the diagonal she'll say to adjust your ruler and then go back and check where you were before okay so you just take your pencil and draw yourself a line. This is going to be a stitching line for later. So you set aside your pencil and your ruler and then what you'll want to do is take this one that you just drew the line across and you have to kind of watch how your diagonals go across there. Okay? You don't want it so that the diagonal line you just drew comes out of the corner where you're attaching it. Okay, I'm putting this in a close-up so y'all can see it. Uh, what you want to do is place it so it's your diagonal line actually sort of straddles the corner itself. Right? So it kind of is, is chopping off the corner in essence. And, and some people, normally the way this has been taught historically is that you would cut or you would uh, sew right on that line. But what we're all discovering is when you sew right on the line, when you go to flip it back, which is really the goal here, then you can end up with a little bit of a truncated corner. Okay? Because, because of the thickness of the fabrics going together and the thread, um, then you end up, if you sew right on the line, it may not flip back entirely. So what I advocate is to sew to just inside of the line, just not right on, but just inside to the corner side of that line. In other words, right here, I'll show you. Okay, so this is one where we drew our line, we placed our square on, catty corner like this, not running this way with your line, and then I sewed just inside the line so that when I flip this back and press it nicely, it's going to really, and the gauge is, that have you, are you completing your rectangle and have you covered up uh, the other fabrics that are underneath there. If you have, and once you get to that point, then some people will leave the bulk underneath because they just, they don't want to take the time to trim all those off. Myself, for like long arm quilting, I don't want to jam up my long arm, or if you were to hand quilt it, you probably wouldn't want the bulk. Uh, so what I'll advocate is to trim off all that extra, trim off the extra of the the uh, bright corner that you added, and also trim off the batik extra that's under there. Trim it to a quarter, it doesn't have to be official, just something uh, approximating a quarter, and then you would press it back, and once you've pressed it back, then you end up with your nice uh, corner, just like that. Okay, so that's your basis for your applique block. So what will we do next? Next, we have to figure out, once we have one of those blocks, all created. So there you can see, there it is with its four corners. I'm going to bring it back here where you all can see it, okay? So there it is with its four corners. What have I done next? So as a part of your templates page, I gave you not only each of the templates for the paw print pieces, okay? Um, but I also gave you a little a little drawing of about how they should lay. Now, for space purposes, I didn't have room to make this little drawing of the paw as big as actual life. 
So you'll just kind of have to use it as a guide, and I'll show you about that in a second. So also, one of your next steps is what you would do is go to this templates page. I want you to cut out all the little pieces of the paw. So there's M, N, O, P, and Q. You'll cut all of those out. Make sure and cut them to, just to the outside of the black line. If you preserve your black line, that way you'll make sure that every, if you use these in the future again, if you trim off your black line, then your template each time, your template can get smaller and smaller without you realizing it. So my best practice and recommendation is to just go ahead and leave that black line on. So cut out all of those pieces. You'll want to take each of those pieces and get yourself just some household kitchen from the grocery store freezer paper. And why does that work? What's good about freezer paper is this. It has sort of a dull side, but it also has sort of a shiny side. They describe it as plastic coated. My best sort of um, description of it is more like wax coated. So you've got the waxy side and you've got the smooth side, the dull side. You will take each one of your templates, such as um, one of these, each of the ones, and you'll lay it to where it is on the dull side, all right? And you'll cut it out. Uh, you can pin it if you want to. Uh, you could put a little dab of glue on there if you wanted to. Do something to hold it firmly so that you can get a nice piece cut out out of the freezer paper. And that's this is one of them, just like your template. And you want to do that for each of the components of the paw. To help myself out, I also, as I cut them out, now for this you only need the one, but it, especially this is helpful if you're ever cutting out lots and lots of pieces. These little shapes are reusable at least a couple, three times before they kind of lose their sticky, and you'll, I'll show you how to do this in a second. You use the iron, you iron it onto the fabric. Uh, in order to do that, um, I didn't want to lose track. These paw pieces look very, very similar to one another, uh, and so I ended up writing also on my little freezer paper piece what its template number or letter was. Right. So you've cut out your template pieces, and then you'll take your fabric, and you essentially, I'm just going to use this for a second, let's use our square, okay? You will take your template, and put your fabric face down, you'll put the waxy, the shiny side of the template down, okay? And then you'll just take your iron and you'll iron it on. Okay. And because it's got that nice wax coating, it sticks, which is pretty handy. And then you will take and cut. Now, here's the deal. Um, you think you were doing yourself a favor. This is pretty tiny, and normally when you're doing turned under edge applique, you don't want to have a lot of bulk underneath there, especially with as many angles as these templates have. Uh, you would think you'd want a little tiny seam allowance. However, I'll show you throughout the rest of the steps. If you get that too tiny, then later you're going to sort of turn these edges under and kind of glue them on the edges. Um, when you go to take the freezer paper out, uh, if the things are too tiny, uh, you'll tend to just have a very difficult time getting your freezer paper out without wrecking all your nice folds and making the fabric ravel out a little bit. So what I would advocate is, is something like a quarter, uh, maybe a little bit of a heavy quarter of an inch. Cut out your template you know, leaving a quarter of an inch border all the way around. And once you have done that, you will end up with a piece that looks like this. And like I say, don't go by mine, because um, not smart. I didn't do the best thing in terms of, I didn't leave myself enough fabric. I came to realize that later when I was working with them. Now, what's your next step? Well, um, what you can do is you can take an Elmer's glue stick. And the thing with the Elmer's glue stick is that they have a pretty big dimension. So, sew line, uh, has come out with a pen, and it actually has a little tiny, tiny, almost Elmer's, but it's different glue, uh, glue stick in it, okay? And you can get refills for it, so it's not a one-time use. So you just roll out a little bit of glue, and you... Here's another trick that I learned that I can share with you. Um, if you put your, your inclination, and most people will teach you, that you put your glue on this little extra part that you left out that sticks outside the template. I learned when you do that, um, it, whatever surface you have it laying on, you end up with quite a bit of glue that can get all over your pressing surface. And that's not really what we're looking for, because then you've got to clean that up later or just throw it away, and nobody has the money for extra tools, all right? So I just drew myself a little line of glue, and I'll take my, my uh, iron, and watching your fingers, and sometimes they make little deals that you can put on your fingers, uh, insulation, almost like the tips of gloves that you can put on, um, that will help you with this if that's a problem. So keep your fingers back, but essentially use the tip of your iron, smallest iron possible, to just turn back, essentially right there where you stuck your glue, all right? And you just go all the way around your template, turn it under all, all of your edges. And then once you have done that, then you are ready. 
show you when it's done. All right, so I think I've gotten rid of my one that's done. Um, once you've done that, once you've got all your edges turned under, then you will sort of rip, tear a little bit on your uh, freezer paper, and then you'll loosen that out. And don't be overly generous with that glue when you're putting it on, because then that can make your freezer paper a little harder to tear out. Once you've got all of your little template pieces um, prepared and ready that way, what you would want to do next is this. You take, you go back to your um, uh, block that you, you did your corners on, and I've already done some of them, and then you will take your um, little template for how to arrange your, and again, remember it's reduced in size a little bit. We're almost using that to our advantage. So I've already kind of figured out where most of mine need to be, but I've left this one. So you, you get your template, here he is, okay, your cutout piece with all of its little turned under nice edges, and you lay it on here. Uh, in terms of these have kind of specific ways that they lay so it ends up looking like the cutest little paw shape okay um, but made out of fabric okay so then I see that it needs to lay that way and so I'll just slip this under here kind of get it where I think I might need it to be and then you can see it's still a little bit uh, sticks out a little bit so I can see that gives me the advantage of seeing where it is so then you remove that pull it away and if you need to adjust it a little bit once you get the, the actual look of just the cutest paw then you do that uh, pin it into place Okay. And what you want to do next is choose some way or the other to applique around these edges. So if you are a hand applique person, go ahead and do that. Or I have a couple of other suggestions for you as well. Um, I don't have time. I don't sit still long enough. I'm a busy girl and I don't have time to hand applique as much as I love to do it. So I do have a few of those laying around, but they don't get as much time and attention as I would like for them to. Um, and then. Uh, decorative stitching, some people tend to tie away, shy away from decorative stitching because it shows and they're not proud of how they stitched it. So a good in-between ground is uh, a simple zigzag stitch. And you think, well, that just looks tacky, that just looks something, you know, maybe, maybe they may have done in the olden days. But we have modernized that zigzag stitch because of some threads that are now available. These are just a couple of examples, all right? There's a particular one called Wonder, and they used to sell it. I don't know if they still do, because I've had these for a little while, but you can find something similar. Um, try and avoid, if you're going to press your block later, try and avoid ones where the, the makeup of the, the, the thread itself will melt under an iron, okay? So find one. This particular one is Wonder. It's nylon, and it, it holds up to the, as long as it's not too hot, then the iron doesn't melt it. They had or have a clear one, and then they also do a smoky one for certain colors of fabrics. I kind of debated with myself because I'm working with both things here. I ended up deciding to go with the clear one. And then what they advocate, uh, anybody, when you're ever using uh, uh, invisible thread, that's the name of what you're looking for, the class that I took a few years back with my local quilt shop, they recommended lingerie and bobbin thread to put into your bobbin. And what does that do? Because of its weight, and if you'll adjust your tension a little bit, just to a point, instead of letting it do automatic tension or your regular tension, if you will let... The, um, the, the bobbin be a little bit tight so that zigzag is almost keeping this bobbin thread because what you don't want is your colored thread or your, your regular thread to show on top. All you're wanting to have is just your invisible threads. So if you'll do that, um, get the right threads and the right setup, practice on an extra piece, and then all I did was I found a zigzag stitch that was not super tight together but enough that would hold the edges down and then also was just the width to where it would come out on the edge, I could sew right along the edge and I could capture the, the background a little bit and then also I could capture just the edge of the applique piece. And if you look at this, I mean you kind of can't tell that it wasn't hand sewn, right? So just because of the luxuries and the advantages of the clear thread. Uh, there's one other option that I can suggest. There's many, many out there. There's so many that we, we could do a whole series on how to do um, applique, various methods of applique because there are that many of them. Another thing that I like, I'm in love with the blanket stitch. So that's um, really fun and most machines, now this is an old, old machine. I'm a, I'm a lover and a fan of antique machines. This is a uh, 301 that I happen to come across and why I like it is it's kind of like the big cousin to the Singer Featherweight if any of you guys are a fan of those. So I was really lucky to come across one of these at a price point where I could afford it and um, so she doesn't have a blanket stitch on. She's just here to keep me company today. Um, I resort to one of my other machines with a blanket stitch and there's a couple of different sizes on mine, so you just have to play with what's on your machine. Some of them are closer together than others in terms of the stitch width, all right? And you kind of have to play with how how deep they go across because what they do is a blanket stitch kind of takes a bite or two along the edge of your applique and then it takes a bite in. And let me illustrate that to you. 
Um, it's kind of hard to understand, and many people shy away from it for that very reason, but I found a couple of really good uh, visuals on Bernina's website. So if you picture this, they've shown, here's a really good picture, I'll put this in the close-up, here's a really good picture of how a blanket stitch works. So it's running along the edge and then it takes a bite in. And the, the real trick and the key to it is you want to, whenever you're needing to turn a corner, you want that you want your stitch or your needle to be on the outside part, not the bite in, okay? If you're on the outside part, then you lift up your presser foot or you use your knee lift, pivot it a little bit, and then when it takes its next bite in, it'll be sort of a neat and even looking thing instead of it taking an awkward bite in in an awkward place. Alright, so there's that. Um, so this this is showing it when it's on the out. Let me show you a little bit of a diagram as well. Okay, so if you're ever doing a curve, you kind of have to pivot it a little bit and then your blanket stitches tend to sort of bend in a little bit with each other. But here's the way to do a corner. You can do exactly what I'm saying. Keep your, as you're needing, when you, you, so you're running along, running along, you have it set to your, your certain depth and width, and when you get to your corner, make sure it's on the bite out along the edge, and then you pick it up, you turn it, and then when it comes forward again, it's going to maybe bite out one more time. Then when it bites in, then it's biting in in a nice way instead of out here somewhere in the field where you don't want it to. So those are just some tips. I actually used, I've got a variety of, um, you know, whoever your thread brand is, they all have variegated threads. I, I thought about using kind of an orange and yellow one. That would have been fun. Um, here's another one with some purple and stuff in it because this confetti fabric has all various colors. Uh, I think I ended up using this one because I felt like it had it had yellow, green, you know, blue, and all some various different ones. And you can see how it turns out. You just get kind of a fun. It's a little bit more forgiving, I feel like too. And also this fabric, you guys, if you're if you're hesitant to ever try a blanket stitch or applique with a machine stitch, this is a pretty forgiving environment because this fabric has so many colors to it. It's not going to be super obvious if you make a misstep on on anything. Okay. All right. So. Those are our blocks. Um, hopefully that's been helpful to y'all in terms of how to do applique, how to form that one block, how to do prairie points. That's something you could do even in some other projects. Let me talk to you about one more thing. I said we would talk about fabric and dogs, which we kind of already did, but you've probably noticed that I have a dog on my shirt. And um, she's a husky. The reason for this one, I'm wearing it today in support of a company or an organization. And the name of it is, I'll hold it up and then I'll put it where you guys can see it in the close-up. In my local area, um, which is uh, in Arkansas, and then also they're based, uh, I think there's some in Kansas City and Iowa, uh, some other places. There's an organization called Tasia Blue, which is T-A-Y-S-I-A, -A, Tasia Blue. And it's based off of the people who started it. Their dog's name was Tasia Blue. If you go onto their website, and in the, um, the description of this video, I will put a link to their website. There's a really neat story about how it all started and who was Tasia Blue. That was a dog of theirs. Um, that, they, they, um, that just kind of was their inspiration for getting this whole thing started. And then they decided they wanted to help other dogs, Huskies, as well. They focus specifically on Huskies and Malamutes. Basically what they do is they try and get them out of shelters, they get them into foster homes, and then they eventually, um, once they've had some time to spend in foster, then they know more about their personalities and they can help uh, pair them up with the right adoptive home. So I think it's really great what they're doing. If you guys would like to get involved um, either by fostering or donating uh, or just whatever, maybe even adopting a dog, uh, oftentimes uh, huskies end up in shelters. It's really sad because people see them in the movies or on TV and they think, yeah, those are beautiful dogs. They don't realize that huskies do require a bit of time and attention. They're what we call sassy and they'll let you, they'll let you know what they're thinking about any particular thing in life. Um, so they require some extra attention, but if you're that kind of person where you would love to get in, in return they will give you their whole heart and all of their love. Um, and, and just all they want is belly rubs and love pretty much. And I will tell you, this dog that's on this shirt is actually uh, a real dog. Her name's Atari. She was a rescue. She was one of the Tasia Blue dogs. She ended up um, being um, adopted by one of the ladies that uh, I've come to know in our local area. She's kind of a facilitator, um, a sponsor. She helps people when they want to either foster or adopt. She helps the, the dogs get out of the shelters, which, which we, um, we don't want to leave them there. That's where, you know, eventually shelters get full and then they have to make really hard decisions. Decisions. And why is this a tie-in, you guys? Uh, it's a tie-in because Dean Russo, who uh, designed this fabric and drew it all and designed and put so much heart and love into these little dog faces, he is a real advocate for adopting a shelter dog and helping out a shelter dog. In fact, 
think I saw on one of his prints, I was looking at his website recently, and it said something to the effect of, you can judge the heart of a person by how they treat a dog. So if you find yourself at all able, uh, we're in a thing in life, a crisis in life right now, where a lot of people are having to spend more time at home. So this may go on for a little bit longer. If that is you and you are in your home situation and you feel like maybe you haven't ever been able to adopt or, or foster a dog because you didn't have the time to spend at home with them while they become acclimated to that environment, now might be an optimal time. So maybe just check out, instead of going to some puppy mill and paying lots and lots of money, the more we do that, those dogs, you know, there, it's just a, a whole thing, that, and eventually they end up on the streets, some of them, and so that's when the shelters get overwhelmed. So let's do our part to see what we can do and try and be an advocate for these guys and see if we can get some dogs out of shelters, if that's something that you feel led to do. I hope this has been helpful to you. Uh, it's been fun. I love talking about this dog fabric. As soon as I saw it, I was like, my face lit up because it's just so very cute. And hopefully you've enjoyed it as well. So um, thanks for joining us and stay tuned. We'll hopefully do some more videos in the future and we'll put them out there where you guys can see them. Thanks so much.